Hi, my name is Jose Asu, and I'm one of the instructors for the BeaverWorks Summer Institute course on design of assistive technology. This is a course about product design. This is a course about the engineering process. But most importantly, it's a course about doing these things with people. In design of assistive tech, we've been looking at what it takes to build something that helps someone with an activity of daily living. We've been talking about how to understand users' interests and needs, how to prototype ideas and refine designs, and how to test these products with users directly in a co-design context. We've learned about what it means to document designs so that students can share their ideas with other makers and people who might benefit from them. Now, students will be showing off the things that they've been co-designing with users and how they've tried to make one person's life just a little bit better. So I hope you stick around and come see what they've been doing. It's been pretty great. All right, good morning, everyone. We are going to be taking a look at today the final product presentations from all of our students. Our students have been working very, very hard and have produced some really, really awesome things that they've been able to test and refine and test some more, and in a lot of cases, deliver to people for actual use. Uh, so we're gonna be going in alphabetical order by first name. So first up, we have the video presentation by Alex. Hi, my name is Alex Wang. I'm from the Assistive Tech course, and today I'll be talking about the waterproof insulin case that I've been designing, or as I like to call it, Winsulin. So first I wanted to introduce my co-designer Sawyer, who I've been working with on this for the past three weeks. Sawyer is a senior at Harvard Westlake along with me. He teaches martial arts and has a black belt in Taekwondo, and he likes to play the piano and the guitar. Sawyer has had type 1 diabetes since he was 10 months old and currently uses a 780G mini med insulin pump. The issue is that he has to take it off for swimming because it's not waterproof, but it starts to beep once it gets more than 8 to 10 feet away from him. And he hasn't bought any commercial cases because he feels that they're too bulky. So I originally started with the idea of making my own waterproof box out of, from scratch out of plastic with a rubber stopper for a lid. As you can see from the design I drew on the left and the actual prototype on the right. However, I soon realized that with my limited cutting abilities, making a box this size out of plastic pop cases because he feels that doing the type 1 diabetes since he was 10 months old and currently uses a 780G mini med insulin pump. The issue is that he has to take it off for swimming because it's not waterproof, but it starts to beep once it gets more than 8 to 10 feet away from him. And he hasn't bought any commercial cases because he feels that they're too bulky. So I originally started with the idea of making my own waterproof box out of from scratch out of plastic with a rubber stopper for a lid. As you can see from the design I drew on the left and the actual prototype on the right. However, I soon realized that with my limited cutting abilities, making a box this size out of plastic probably wouldn't be feasible within the time limit. So I decided to go with a design that secured the insulin pump in place inside of a commercially available waterproof bag. And I actually ended up making the inner box out of plastic, which is shown on the top right, but it took me five hours alone just for that small box, showing that it probably wouldn't have been feasible to make the larger box. The inner box essentially keeps the insulin pump from being thrown around in the bag, protecting the wire at the top from bending too much and breaking. The plastic box is secured in the commercially available waterproof bag and glued to the bottom, making the overall design waterproof, safer at the insulin pump, easy to use, and less bulky than other designs out there, which crosses off all the user needs I had in the beginning. And here's a video demonstration of my co-designer putting the insulin pump into the product. And so you can see that it only took him around 10 seconds to put it in and close the bag. And for future improvements, I would just try to make the case even less bulky than it is now, either by hand making it out of plastic like I was planning on for my first designs or 3D printing the box, which I wasn't able to do in this course because of the time constraint. So I hope you all now have a bit, little better understanding of what went into creating my final prototype. And thank you all for listening. Yeah, so uh, if people want to go ahead and slid on the slide out for any questions, but um, I can get us started with one and just ask Alex, uh, how did you 
decide that this was the way that you want to teach your products, like what made you go the waterproof route um, instead of like just a typical like storage container? Um, I decided to go the waterproof route because he, my co-designer specifically mentioned that um, he was having an issue with that, with the fact that the other containers were out there were too bulky. And so I want, I want to make a waterproof case that, that was like very slim, uh, as un unbulky as possible. And that could be right next to him in the pool. And then another question, um, just in general, but I guess for specifically you, how did you find your co-designer? Um, I'm actually friends with Sawyer at school. And so um, he was the first guy I thought of. And so I just contacted him immediately. All right, thank you, Alex. Going on to the next. Hi everyone, my name's Alicia and I'm a rising senior in the Bay Area. My product's name is Blackout. So Blackout is designed for my co-designer who is the person that we work with on the project and who the product is for. And my co-designer's name is Divya and she uses she, him pronouns. She's a rising senior at the same high school as me and is the captain of the varsity field hockey team and loves to work with clay, paints, and wood. So Divya gets super sudden migraines that give her extreme light sensitivity and blurs her vision. So from that, we came up with a few user needs that the product would have to address. So first and foremost, it would have to block out light and then it should not press against her eyes and has to be comfortable to sleep in because that's what Divya primarily does during his migraines. It has to alert Divya's parents and also create a comforting environment. So it's also important to note that Divya has tried commercially available products before like eye masks, but that did block out enough light and will suppress against her eyes. So based on these user needs, I came up with using ski goggles because ski goggles already have foam built in so wouldn't press against his eyes. And I modified them so that they would have Velcro attached to it. So it could just be easily adjusted. And I blocked out the inside so that you can't see anything through them and provides total blackout when she puts them on. So Divya also mentioned it'd be nice to have a little box for storage. So I made a wooden box specifically to the dimensions of the ski goggles. And on top of the wooden box, I attached a smart button. And the smart button addresses the last two user needs, which is texting her parents and creating a comfort comfortable environment. So as you can see here, um, with one click of the button, it starts playing her favorite song, puts the volume to 17% because we don't want any loud noises from her phone um, interrupting her migraine and making it worse. And it also sends a text message and her location to her parents for safety. So. Here is my final latest prototype. And as you can see, I added a little guide to the button just so that Divya would remember what each click does. And the double click and the hold is just for music controls because he mentioned specifically that music really helps during migraines. And I added padding on the bottom of the box just because I don't want the lenses to be scratched. And here is the back view of the box with the button. So here is Divya actually using the product. It's in bed because that's where Divya will mainly be using it because again, she'll just be sleeping. So with just one click of the button and then he goes and puts on the glasses really easily and it sends a text to her parents with the location and a little message. And it starts playing music that you can't hear right now because this is muted. And yeah, so it's just a really simple way to make her migraines a little bit easier. And thank you for listening to my presentation. Yeah, so for Alicia, um, how did you come up with the idea of a button versus um, some other devices that could be used instead? So I was actually first trying to use um, an Alexa, just because Alexas are really simple to use and she could just kind of talk to it. Um, but then I kind of talked to Divya a little bit more and I realized that during her migraines, she doesn't really have like too much coherent thought and she just kind of wants to lie down. So I figured that it'd just be easiest for her to be able to press a button and have everything be done with one press of a button instead of like talking to an Alexa and having to come up with a bunch of directions and actually communicating with anything. Um, and the button is just like the easiest way for her to get everything done just really quickly. Awesome. Also, I had a question. Oh, sorry, Fiona. Yeah, you can go are, I, I, are there any questions from, um, if there's any other questions, let me know. Um, but Alicia, my question. Uh, so, so unfortunately, we we do actually need to keep on going. Oh, okay. I'll chat it in. <laughs> Sorry. 
Hi, my name is Arnav. I'm from the Assistive Technology course, and here's my project um, about NFC screen tapping. So here's some introduction. So my co-designer's name is Winston, and he's a 14-year-old son of a family friend with classic nonverbal loss. This means that he has trouble communicating, and he only has approximately 10 words of expressive language. Um, he has minimal sensory capability, so things like adverse reactions to loud noises or crowds. And he has neither visual nor sensory impairment. So he has perfect sight and perfect hearing. So here are some of my co-designer's needs. So currently, my co-designer communicates using a sensor board, uh, as you can see on the right. And he does this by pointing to letters and forming words. Uh, however, he can't use a normal keyboard because of its four small keys and its format. Um, it's, it's play, which is in QWERTY format. And um, my product needs to provide a similar physical metaphor to what he normally uses, so he's comfortable using it. And it should help him communicate faster and more efficiently without sacrificing accuracy, which results in more independence and greater communication. Uh, here's some of the design process I went through while doing this. So based on my co-designer's needs and after interviewing him, I came up with two possible ideas. So one was the NFC screen tapping project, which I eventually built, and the other was the laser protection virtual keyboard. After speaking to him once again, I built an initial prototype of the, um, the NFC screen tapping. And I quickly ruled out the laser protection because of its small key size, which is not suitable for him. And I um, built the uh, first prototype, as you can see uh, below. Um, and on the right is the NFC reader. And just for scale, um, I put a quarter next to it. So as you can see, it's pretty small. And based on feedback I got, and after testing, uh, I improved upon my design, and I built a second prototype. So here's the final product, and also a demo. Hi, everyone. So today, I'm going to be showing you a demo of my NFC screen tapping project. So here is my NFC reader right here, and here is my keyboard. So as you can see, that's all the letters. Uh, from A to Z in alphabetical order. And here's some Python code, which I wrote. And I'm going to go ahead and run it. OK. So the way this works is that when this, um, this reader comes into contact with any of these keys, it outputs the letter corresponding to that tag. So for example, if I wanted to print out hello, I would say H. Let me rerun this. Okay. E. L. L. O. And that's basically it. Okay. Thank you for watching my presentation. That's great. Fun. We have a question. Um, people are wondering what NFC means um, and what exactly is it? Yeah, so NFC stands for near, near field communication. And you might see it like whenever you go to a grocery store or anything like that. Um, so basically, it allows like when there's two, um, there's basically two components. So there's like a reader and then like a receiver, so which is like a tag. So when the uh, reader comes into contact, like within like a few inches of the tag, it basically scans the tag and um, it basically outputs some. Um, that it transmits information basically wirelessly using a, I think, 125 kilohertz frequency. Hi, I'm Claire, and I'm a current rising high school senior taking the assistive technologies course. Over the summer, I designed a wearable trackpad that would help lessen wrist pain that my co-designer felt when using his computer. So a little bit about my co-designer. He is my dad, and he works as a project manager currently. Over many years, he developed carpal tunnel syndrome in his right hand which led to wrist pain and a numb feeling in his fingers. He's used several solutions, such as a trackpad, a trackball, and finally a vertical mouse, but none of these solutions allowed him to keep his wrist off of the desk and prevent his wrist from being strained from a grip position. Through several user interviews, we decided that the product must keep his hand in a relaxed position rather than the grip position that his current mouse does. It should allow him to use mouse controls without restraint. So this would include scrolling and clicking. It should take the pressure off his wrist and lastly, be comfortable to use while standing up.
The idea for my product was basically to allow my co-designer to stand in his most comfortable standing position while still being able to use mouse controls. You can see in these diagrams that the trackpad would rest right where his right hand would be when he's just standing up straight with his arms relaxed at his sides. And here's a diagram of the concept. It would just basically have clips with adjustable straps attached to a trackpad that's inside a 3D printed case. And here is the CAD model for the 3D printed case. So this is the prototype that I have ended up with by the end of the course. And here I just have a demo video of him using the trackpad and some of his comments on how it felt. Left and right. Yeah, that works. Actually, this is perfect. Yeah. That's how I would do it. It's very easy. Yeah, going towards the very early. And yeah, that is basically a demonstration of how the trackpad works on his own computer and with my co-designer. Overall, I'm pretty happy with how the product fulfilled the user needs. And finally, thank you so much to Hosea, Kyle, Amanda, Fiona, Yusuf, and Marnie for your guidance throughout this course. Thank you for listening. Awesome. Um, thank you. And we have a question. What made you go like the trackpad um, path route and kind of like how did you decide how did you reach like the end goal? Like, how did you get to this idea? Because it's so new. Yeah, so I originally decided on a trackpad because um, he did feel a lot of wrist pain from keeping his hand in a grip position that like his current mouse required him to have. Um, and I got to like putting the trackpad on his leg because um, he did tell me in an inf interview that he preferred to stand while he was working. And his most comfortable standing position was just having his hands resting at his sides. So I decided to take advantage of that and put the trackpad right where his hand would rest. Hi, my name is Daniel Wayne, and I'm part of the assistive technology course at BWSI. And this is my project at Hope in Hand. So some things we'll be going over in this presentation are who my co-designer is, that is the intended user of this product, what my product is, and the low and high fidelity prototype of this product. First off, my co-designer. His name is Ty. He's a middle school student from Fresno, California and he has a passion for video games and sports. One of his favorite video games is NBA 2K, and one of his favorite sports is football. But something unique about Ty is that he does not have a right hand, and this is actually one of his favorite players, Chicken Griffin, who does not have a left hand. And so after a long process of brainstorming and interviewing, we came up with a product. So we decided that we wanted to build a 3D prosthetic hand that would give Ty the ability to grasp and hold things with his right hand. And so we settled on the idea of that. And the good thing is that it already exists. It's called the Enable Phoenix Hand V3. And it's something that you can 3D print and assemble by yourself. It also comes with a kit that you can buy that includes all the non 3D printed components, such as Velcro straps, rubber tips, and et cetera. Something about this design is that it's wrist actuated, meaning that if you want to open and close the fingers, you would have to move your wrist. This requires adequate um, palm dexterity and a large enough partial palm size be able to be used. So this is something that the low fidelity prototype wanted to assess. It's whether Ty had that adequate partial palm size and um, enough wrist dexterity. And so this is the prototype that we built and it includes the 3D printed portion of the palm and it uh, includes a manufactured 3D cardboard forearm guard. And so the purpose is to see if Ty has enough wrist dexterity and partial palm size. And so we asked Ty to move his wrist up and down and to see if it was comfortable. And it turns out it was. So there's nothing we needed to change to original design. So in our next fidelity prototype or high fidelity prototype, we decided that we wanted to assemble the Foley hand. So this is the full hand um, scaled at 155% scale. And for reference, that's a little bit larger than my hand. And it allows Ty to slip his partial palm into this region. And it includes Velcro straps, not seen in this photo, to tie across his uh, uh, forearm. So this is a picture of Ty using the hand, and um, he's holding for the first time ever um, a cup with his right hand. And this is a picture, a video of him opening and closing the hand. And if you look carefully, you'll see him bend his wrist down to close the fingers and release his wrist to open the fingers. So he enjoyed that a lot and it was really great to see him do that. 
And so some key takeaways that you got from this presentation is that you learned a little bit more about who my co-designer was. You learned about the product that we built and the low and high fidelity prototypes of the product. And I just wanted to say thank you to all the instructors and TAs and admins that made this program possible. It was a great experience and thank you so much. All right, that was awesome. Um, we have a question about how do you plan on um, going forward since you know your co-designer is in middle school? And so how do you think that will affect um, your design overall? Yeah, so we talked about plans of scaling up the original design since it scaled at only 155%. So we had plans of scaling it up and also maybe changing the material a bit since it's made out of PLA plastic. They thought of changing the material and some components so it'd be more durable. Hi everyone, I'm Federico Vegas, a rising senior at Wellesley High School and this is my BWSI project. So my co-designer was my second cousin who is 52 years old, has three kids and loves to spend time with his family. However, because he is quadriplegic, he can't join his family when they go on biking trips in the woods walks on the beach, or anywhere that a wheelchair can't go. For my project, I set out to make a vehicle that can go 50 miles an hour on off-road terrain and can be controlled with only the hands and no use of limb strength. Here is my product objective. To address these needs, I adapted a commercially available trike with a joystick and throttle controls for steering, braking, and acceleration. The acceleration came in the form of the throttle and motor that came with the trike, repositioned to fit the user's needs. The steering is done with a linear actuator connected to a steering rod to turn the trike. Another linear actuator is connected to two conjoined bike brakes and it pulls on those wires to slow and stop the trike. Both are controlled with an Arduino using a joystick as a user interface. I had never before done such a complex project alone, so there was definitely a learning curve for me. Some of the challenges I faced in this project was not knowing anything about electrical engineering or coding and having to do a lot of external research to learn the skills I needed as I went along. Another issue was managing time in just one month with the delays in ordering parts. On the final day of the program, I was finally able to assemble everything together and get the vehicle to work, which felt great to end with a working product. Later this month, my co-designer will be testing the trike out following some structural fine tuning. But for now, here's a video of me using the trike. Thank you for watching. Okay, and a question. Um, what made you choose such a complicated project with so many components? Um, which then you had to learn a lot. So when I um, learned about this course, I was really excited and I called my second cousin and he was actually really passionate about an idea of being able to like kind of joyride and spend time with his family. And he'd done a lot of external research and never found a viable solution for this problem. So I said, great, I think I can, might be able to manage to do it and it would be a great learning experience. I'm definitely gonna try to tackle this project. So I was just really excited and just jumped on it on the get-go. Hi, my name is Grace and I'm from California. For this assistive tech course, I designed a product called A Step Up. So in this presentation, I'll briefly go over who my co-designer is, our product objective, our, latest, our, our design process, our latest prototype and our future plans for this product. So my co-designer is Jocelyn. She's my friend's aunt. She loves gardening and she also lives in the Bay Area. However, she has Parkinson's disease, which for her means that she has trouble balancing. So we decided to come up with a product that would help her safely reach shell higher shelves around her house. And it would also provide ample space for her feet to regain balance, be relatively light to transport. And it would also have to withstand around 150 pounds of weight. So first off, we decided to find a stool that had a large base for her feet to move around and something that provided around seven to nine inches of height. We found this stool on Amazon, which perfectly fit our requirements since it had a large base, had around nine inches of height and was relatively light. And it was also made out of sturdy material. We decided to create some sort of design where there were railings around the stool for her to hold onto. However, the issue was that was the material that the railings were made out of. We briefly considered using metal to 
create the railings and also wood so that we could integrate com compactability into the design. However, ultimately we decided to use PVC pipes which were light and sturdy to use. Then we bought the materials and assembled the things together without gluing everything as that would provide room for adjustment. Um, my aunt and uncle graciously helped me test it and on the two images on the left here, my uncle is lifting himself off the stools with only the railings and he is around 150 pounds. Then I brought the prototype back to my co-designer for testing and here she is on the left reach, using the step up prototype to reach her tomatoes in the middle, her shells and on the left, her lights. She was pretty happy about the design so then I glued everything together and brought it back for a final test and here she is using the stool to reach higher shelves. So for some future improvements, I was thinking about making it more collapsible or easy to store. And, or if she likes the prototype that we have now, making the current design easier to transport since the PVC pipe, pipes are pretty bulky. And we were thinking about using the platinum stool, um, platinum health stool here and adjusting it for her height and for her preferences. Um, I'd also like to thank my co-designer, my family, the BW site admins, and my instructors and TAs, and also to my classmates who are all such truly, truly talented people. And I'd say that I am truly blessed to have been able to meet these people out of billions of people in the world. And most of all, thank you for listening. Awesome. Um, so the question is, how would you make the current design more transportable, um, as you mentioned in the slides? Um, yeah, so as mentioned in the slides, I was thinking of using the only like pre-existing solution I was able to find. Um, it was like a Platinum Health stool. The brand is Platinum Health. And um, so it's basically pretty compact, but the issue is that uh, there are no railings in the front and the height is too low for my co-designer's needs. So I would probably make it higher and adjust it to her needs. Hi, my name is Isaac Chung. I'm part of the assistive tech course here at BWSI and I wanted to present the traveling grip I designed for my co-designer C. So C is a relative of mine who lives in Hong Kong. She enjoys watching cooking shows and shopping with her friends. Um, she goes on daily grocery errands in different markets. Uh, she lives with her grandchildren in a small apartment and C has arthritis which has made gripping extremely difficult for her right hand. So because my co-designer uh, goes on daily grocery errands, um, her arthritis has uh, really tampered with her ability to do it by herself, often requiring outside assistance to hold doors or hold bags. And so we wanted to make a product based on these needs, which prevent gripping and hand pains um, in the product itself, wanting to be portable and lightweight for her traveling and the product supporting her in doing her errands comfortably without any form of outside assistance. So um, because of that, the product objective we named or we created was to make a portable grocery holder, which makes limited to zero usage of C's hand or any form of gripping. So here's my newest iteration, which I've designed. Um, over here is the grip where you load the groceries held by this lock for adjustability, and this is the 3D pin printed design. So here is the demonstration of the lock system for adjustability. And this is the demonstration. And so for future improvements I'd like for this project, uh, I'd like to scale down the product since it's a bit clunky uh, for comfortability from a co-designer and to reduce the possible drag of overweight um, bags. Um, I'd like to make a less complicated design since, for, since this product in general is, in my opinion, over-engineered for the task it's supposed to follow. And so I've looked into simpler designs such as interlocking pieces which my instructors have um, suggested and the support itself for this design 
um, is very short term. Um, over time, I can see it breaking down, so I'd like to look for a better long term solution. So I'd like to thank my assistive tech TAs and instructors and the BWCI admin for the opportunity and guiding me through the design process. All right, um, and we have a question. And we're wondering, someone's wondering how much does it weigh um, and how is it portable? Like, does someone carry it around or put it in a bag or anything like that? So um, I'm not actually completely sure about the weight, but it is pretty lightweight since it is PLA plastic. Um, and portability, so it's a wristband, so you just attach it to your arm whenever you need to grip on the sling, like groceries, for example, but it can work with many other objects. Hi, I'm Xi'an. I'm from AD Course. I'm going to present my product, a PLA holder chair. So here's a list of things I'm going to touch up in my presentation. There's a quick intro, intro to my cooking center. I'm going to move on to the design process and the product demo. So my co-designer is my brother. He's a writing software who loves playing sport in general, but especially basketball and running. He recently fractured his ankle. You can imagine how unpleasant this decision was, but more importantly was how he managed the healing process. So he made a lot of efforts to deal with difficulty in nursing his leg, ankle pain, and efficiency of looking for an extra chair in everywhere. So needless to say, it was unpleasant uh, moment for him and people around him. So that's how I came up with a new thing. So the product objective is a standard that my product has to reach in order to be useful or efficient. So my product should help um, help him rest his leg, but also protect his leg from um, potential harms in use by his classmate or other people. So inspired by this, I came up with the very first visual um, representation. It helped me to create my first prototype, which is made of the styrofoam sheet for the main board and the cardboard for the legs and the leg resting part. So this is my um, the drawing for my final product. So as you can see, it is composed of the two main parts. The one is for the leg rest and other one is the main board. And there's a three hinges attached to the leg resting part and two sponges covering the main board acting as um, the cushion materials. Yeah, so the most recent iteration so these pictures are from different views. So you can see um, there is a lag on the back and you can see like how the cushions are serving as um, the element of the comfort. Oh, so this is a picture of my brother testing the product. Yeah, so he's wearing a fracture bandage. And this time he's wearing a walking boot. So it's different from the first image. And here's a video. So as you can see, he is going to school while carrying my product with a single hand. So I made this pro uh, product the portable. Yeah. So the improvements and the for the future and the future changes. So I decided to make a cushion with the styrofoam covered by the liner so that um, it will feel like more comfortable. And I will replace the handle with a plastic handle. And I would find the materials that are um, the liner for the main board. Thank you. All right. Um, we have a question about the portability. Um, so as we saw, it was being able to be lifted by like one hand and carried, but some people are wondering if there were other ways or if you were thinking about implementing other ways for somebody to transport it as well. Yeah, so um, basically um, my product is like portable, so you can easily um, carry it with a single hand, but I'm thinking about like um, putting it with um, like a backpack so you can like attach them together, not carrying it in one single hand. So I'm thinking about that for the future changes. Hi, my name is Kate Watchmaker, and I am from the Assistive Technology Program at Beaverworks. Uh, over the summer, I have been making a bottle slash soap dispenser uh, squeezer, which will be explained more in this presentation. So over the summer, I've been working with a dear friend of mine, Caitlin, and she loves it uh, based on the Stephen King novels, and she and I both go to a vocational school in which she studies uh, to be a dental hygienist. 
and she also loves four wheelers, which is super cool. We've been friends for a really long time. However, recently she uh, suffered a stroke and lost mobility in her left arm and some mobility in her leg. Now, after talking for a while, we began to realize that squeezing bottles had become a really, really big challenge for her. And pump bottles were also very hard too because she can't bend down due to her leg being in not the best shape. So we came up with the following idea. Um, after many, many iterations, we came up with a funnel-like mechanism that could be pumped and suctioned to a different type of walls and anywhere in her house. So if she needed to, um, you know, bring it with her for traveling or put it in the kitchen or so forth. Now, as you can see here, this was my final product. The funnel is made out of blue PLA from the Ender 3 um, 3D printer that I have. And the bottom you can see on the pump is from one of those 90 soap dispensers that I found. And it screws on. I had to specifically make the, the threads on the funnel specific to that uh, the pump being screwed on there. And the suction cup handle is typically used as a grab bar. But in this case, we're going to be using it for her to move it around and everything. And here's a demonstration. Um, after testing, we noticed that the, it goes a little bit up, but it works and it's very exciting and it's been making her life a lot easier, which is cool. This can also be used for condiments and we've been trying it out because we recently got in contact and we've been trying it out in our home and it's been working really well. And as you can see, there's two clamps on the suction cups, which can be taken down with one hand. And it's giving her that little bit of independence that she needs to make her life just a little bit easier. Not only that, but in the kitchen, it can be used too, as like, um, like a sanitized dispenser or just something near the sink that you can have before you wash your hands. And it's just made her life so much easier. And I'm just so happy that I'm able to show you this product. Thank you all for listening. Awesome. Um, a few questions are, do you have um, any preferences to like future iterations where, like you said, the funnel went up a little bit? Do you have any plans to make sure that um, it is more uh, likely to last longer? Yeah, totally. I'm going to be making a flat side to the funnel that I'm just going to directly drill on to the bar so it just won't move up anymore. Hi, I'm Lucy Gunther, and today I'm going to tell you a little bit about my laundry sled for my grandparents, Harriet and Herb. These are my grandparents. My grandmother has Alzheimer's disease, and my grandfather is her primary caregiver. This means that their schedule mostly consists of daily tasks like eating and cleaning, but in their free time, they like to read the newspaper, visit family, and take naps together. After interviewing my grandfather, we decided that the main goal was going to be cre to create something to help him with his daily chores so that he can care for himself and for my grandmother Harriet a little bit better. After brainstorming with my grandfather and a bunch of other family members and going through a lot of different designs, I finally landed on a sled and a pulley system to move laundry up and down the stairs. This is a sketch of the final design. So I wanted to use some sort of storage reel so that the rope wouldn't be all over the floor at the top and a system that had a handle so that you could just crank it to bring the whole sled up the stairs. And although I originally wanted to use a hand winch, it ended up being too heavy and too high tech for my needs and I wouldn't have been able to mount it on the wall because it's designed to pull things in like the 2000 pound range like boats. Um, so I had to find a lower tech solution which ended up being a, an extension cord storage reel and then I added some extra pulleys, like the snatch block pulleys at the front of the sled to redistribute the weight so that it would only require half the force to pull the sled up the stairs. Here are some images of my final prototype. Unfortunately, it did not work quite how I wanted it to. I had some issues with installation process and mounting the storage reel on the wall. And because it's meant for storage, it wasn't really able to carry the force of the sled like I would have liked it to. So the final prototype ended up being more of a concept proof design. And in the future, if I could add on to it, 
I want a new system for the rope reel, something in between, like closer to a 50 pound range in between the winch and the storage reel. I wanted to add those pulleys you saw in the um, sketch because I didn't want to put more holes in the wall after I discovered that my system didn't work and didn't end up installing those. I also needed a system to dismount the sled at the top of the stairs because the landing was really small. And so that might be adding a handle to the front of the sled so that my grandfather wouldn't have to bend down when picking it up. I also needed a locking mechanism for the rope so that if my grandfather did let go of the rope at any time, the sled wouldn't go shooting back down the stairs. And then some sort of storage system for the sled at the bottom of the stairs so that when it's not in use, it's out of the way. Um, I hope you got a better understanding of my product. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um... A couple questions that we have um, kind of surround the future improvements and wondering, you know, obviously you have a plan for that, but people were kind of wondering if you have, if you're going to continue working on it and if you have a plan um, more planned out, like what, what would you be able to use in order to complete what you want to? Um, so I did a lot of research on systems other than the storage reel, and unfortunately I couldn't find anything on the market in the, in the United States. I found a lot of things that may work that are sold in Europe, so I would have to do a lot more research to try and find something that would work for my needs, and I don't know how feasible that would be in the near future. Hi, my name is Matthew Lee, and I'm in the assistive technology course, and this is my final project, the Tremor Helper. So about my co-designer, my co-designer is my grandpa who currently lives in South Korea. And some of his interests are he enjoys relaxing, which includes watching TV, reading the newspaper and going on walks. He also enjoys hanging out with his friends and playing poker. Some challenges he described to me during our interview are that since around 15 years ago, he's been having shaky hands and he tends to spill his drinks when his hands are shaking and something important is that he actually spills less when he's not paying attention. So through our interview, we came up with three need statements. First, he needs to hold the cup steadily. Second, he needs to make sure the content inside the cup doesn't spill. And third, he needs to hold the cup without dropping it. And so in order to address these three need statements, we came up with a final prototype that has a silicone cover that he can adjust to any cup size in his house and also an attachable and detachable paracord or silicon handle. And so in order to build this, unfortunately, I did not get the materials that I want to build with, so I had to make use of what I could in my house, which is predominantly uh, cardboard. And so I first created cut out cardboard handle and using a rebar technique, I put in small pieces of cardboard in between two cardboard handle shapes in order to strengthen it and make it more sturdy and stable. Next, I added modeling clay all over that handle to add more grip and a more comfortable feeling for my co-designer. And for the final steps, I would add cardboard strips, reinforced with duct tape to mimic the bands that I can attach and detach around any cup size, which are both at the top of the handle and the bottom of the handle. And I would use food wrap to mimic my silicone cover with a seal or a rubber band. So after testing, the results from this prototype are that the handle and the bands around the cup were actually really st steady and were able to uh, hold the cup steadily and stable. There was some leakage, however, due to the food wrap not being a full tight seal. However, once I actually get my materials, this can be easily solved. And also the grip itself was really comfortable and easy to hold. And thank you for listening. All right, we have a few questions about your cup. Um, first of all, people were wondering, um, how could you make it adaptable to different um, cups? And then how is the handle size affecting, um, affects like the tremors if that is part of the reason why it helps your grandfather? All right, so um, for the adaptable cup size, I've been using like these bands or silicon bands that I can tighten and loosen around any cup diameter that I would like. And also for the grip, um, I mainly use like around an 11 centimeter handle grip size that I molded into a shape that felt comfortable. However, I could probably, I wish to go test with my grandfather directly in Korea later on and see his uh, real grip shape. 
Hi, I am Megana, a student from the Assistive Technology course, and today I will be talking about Footlift. So by the end of this presentation, you'll have a better idea of my prototype and the steps that I took to get me there. So we're going to start with an introduction and then move on to a description of my overall product and then my final prototype. So my co-designer is Rashita, and she's the person who I will be designing for and whose ideas I will be using to modify my design. So she is a high school senior who enjoys cooking and baking. However, she experiences feet injuries and rolling feet that roll inward whenever she walks. So it's very difficult for her to exercise and walk. She has tried solutions such as ankle braces. However, they were very uncomfortable and the insoles. However, the insoles did not work with sandals and other types of footwear. So that's why I designed the product Footlift. So some things that Rashida needed were that um, she needed to feel comfortable and she wanted to wear multiple shoes. Also, she wanted a long-term solution and she wanted to feel supported while she was walking and exercising. So for my final prototype, I included uh, all of these components to address those user needs. So there was the side support aspect that had foam along with the denim uh, to provide adequate support and comfort, along with an ankle band that wrapped around her ankle and arch to provide both arch support and ankle support. Additionally, the heel support kept everything in place while also supporting the back of her foot. And then here's the band of the ankle support when it's unwound. And then here is the side support and heel support section. So this is essentially an insole along with um, denim. And then along the inside of the denim is a layer of foam that further supports her sides of the foot. And then at the back is heel support. So these two strands essentially wrap around the heel and come back to the front. So then um, it keeps the product in place onto her foot. And all of these components are adjustable so she can adjust as she wants. And then here is her testing it with the sneaker. Here's a video of her walking. As you can see, the product is actually onto her foot. So while she walks, she's not having that awkward phase where her product is on the ground, but her foot is off. It stays in place and matches her foot movement. Okay, so for the results of the final prototype, the foam provided adequate side support. The denim and spandex kept the feet from rolling inwards. It was thin enough to fit inside of sneakers and flip-flops and the spandex provided adequate ankle support as well. However, the fa fabric did tend to bunch up inside of the shoe. So some suggestions for next time is to use a different material or to use um, denim that has better measurements so that it won't bunch up when she wears it. And then here's what I talked about in my presentation. And hopefully now you have a better understanding of my prototype and the steps that I took to get me here. Thank you. All right, um, and then the question is, why did you choose denim for a material? So originally I tried like t-shirt fabric, but that was way too flexible and it did tend to like peel at the sides. Um, I found that denim was like quite sturdy while also having a bit of flexibility just in case you did need to adjust something. And it was very supportive when I tested in my previous prototypes. Hi, my name is Miriam Brody. I'm from California and I'm a senior in high school. I'm passionate about using computer science and engineering to create technologies to help individuals. So I've absolutely loved having the opportunity to take the assistive technology course and build my project. My project is called the garden cart. Let me introduce you to my co-designer. My co-designer is Meg. Meg is a retired science teacher. She loves cooking, traveling, reading, and gardening. I interviewed her, talked to her, learned about her context, and I found that she had two needs that I would address over the next, past four weeks which were that Meg needs to minimize bending as she replants and harvests in her garden, and Meg needs a centralized place to keep her gardening tools and coffee cup. Specifically for the first need statement, with gardening and repotting plants and harvesting, there's a lot of knee bending, and that causes Meg knee, knee pain. So I developed something to address that. And what I did is create a high, stable, portable surface that Meg could use to harvest and repot plants, the garden cart. The garden cart allows Meg to have a potting bench all around her garden, as it is specifically designed to her height to not cause shoulder strain or knee pain, and can fit in all the small parts of her garden. She can also use it for harvesting. When she's harvesting something, she doesn't have to put down the, she doesn't have to bend down to put the things that she harvests in a basket, but she has it right there. And when she's done, she can take the removable gray bin and take it somewhere else. Now, I'm gonna show you how I made it. So I created this by first building the frame and the legs. For my design, I worked to make it an extremely sturdy design. I used strong metals that would be able to withstand outdoor weather, and I even made it waterproof. 
Now, let me show you a little video demonstration of the product. into the shade and look at this harvest basket oh I oh it is so cool self-contained this is my area that has geraniums there we go one down many more to go that was the video demonstration of my co-designer meg trying out the product so the next steps that I hope to take this product is, first of all, test and add storage to both the bottom and the sides. So Meg has a place to put her gardening tools. I want to add more stability to this cart so it feels even stronger than it already is. And I want to add a coffee or water holder to address another one of Meg's needs. And I want to add more support to the sides of the cart. I've absolutely loved working with Meg and I'm so thankful for this opportunity to have created and developed this project. I'm excited to move forward and continue to build upon this project. Awesome. Um, and we have a question about the wheels that you chose to use. Um, people are wondering if they worked well on rough surfaces and would you use the same ones again or possibly explore different wheels? The wheels worked well on a variety of surfaces. They were able to work on grass, pebble, dirt, concrete, and also more rocky dirt. And I think in future adjustments, I would like to look for wheels that possibly can go better through that terrain and also make less noise because that was one issue we had with the wheels. But overall, I'm very happy with the wheels and that they function very well. Hello, my name is Nandana Venkatesh. I'm in the assistive technology course and my product is the pollen stopper. My co-designer for this course is my dad. One of his main hobbies is gardening. However, he has pollen allergies while gardening. His symptoms include itching of the eyes and sneezing. To mitigate these, he has worn masks and sunglasses outside to block pollen. While these have worked, they've been uncomfortable and they haven't blocked all pollen, so he wishes to protect himself from pollen in his eyes, nose, and mouth while still being able to garden. When creating a product, we decided to start with the, ideas of, with the idea of sunglasses and a mask and brainstorm from there. After some exploration, I decided that some form of goggles and a mask would best meet his needs. I made two low fidelity prototypes to test out my design. When I was designing the first, my plan was to make my own goggles out of laser cut polycarbonate. This prototype revealed to me the importance of ensuring the proper fit for any pair of goggles. After making this prototype, I received feedback to look into commercially available goggles. My next lo-fi prototype was meant to test this concept and it revealed that pre-made goggles, if modified, would meet my co-designer's needs. So using that concept of pre-made goggles, this is my final prototype. It consists of a reusable mask that filters air down to particles one micron in size, pre-made. The second component is the goggles, which are ski goggles with a few modifications. First, they include fabric to make sure that they will block all pollen. And secondly, they include slightly trimmed foam to improve visibility, especially when looking down. Here are a few images of my co-designer wearing this product. While testing, I also collected some quantitative data to compare my product to this previous sunglasses solution. And here's a video of this product in action. Overall, this prototype met most of my user needs. It protects my co-designer from pollen and after some testing seemed to almost completely prevent his symptoms. It allows visibility, is breathable, and can be cleaned. On the right is an image of the goggles after being soaked in soapy water, a cleaning method I devised after a bit of research that doesn't damage the goggles. Going forward, I would also like to reduce the bulkiness of the silicone frames to improve peripheral vision, especially when looking down, since this is a lingering issue with this product. I would also like to make them look closer to normal glasses so he can use them even when not gardening. Overall, though, this product was a success, and I'm really happy to have solved my dad's problem. Once I finished my first project, I had a bit of time left in the course, so I decided to start on a second. 
My dad's allergies were largely solved outdoors, but indoors he couldn't use the goggles. He has an air purifier that he uses to remove allergens from the air, but he doesn't leave it on since it wastes power. I decided to create a way for it to turn on only when it needs to using a particulate matter sensor that would turn on a smart plug only when dust levels were high. Thus far, I've been able to turn on a smart plug using this microcontroller shown. My next step is to learn how to take sensor input into that microcontroller, which I'll do after the course. The process of solving a problem doesn't always have a neat ending, but I'm super excited to continue helping my dad. Thank you so much for the course and for listening. All right, um, and we have a question for part one and part two of your project. Um, part one was just wondering if you're thinking about combining the mask and the goggles into one piece. Um, and then the part two was, um, how are you thinking about continuing working on your sensor? Sure, so for part one, I actually considered combining the, well, the goggles and the mask initially when I was making the, the first prototype, but I decided not to since I didn't want the goggles to fog. Um, and as for the second, uh, I'm definitely gonna continue working on it. Um, the there's going to be a maker portfolio on our course website if you want to look at my future steps but my next plan or my next step is essentially to figure out how the sensor data um, can work with the microcontroller so i'll probably do some prototypes with uh, lower quality sensors like that are much simpler to work with before i work up to the complicated one that i purchased hello my name is eugene Narajan, and i'm here to present my product the stair climbing walker so my co-designer's name is Amiko Sundaresan. She's my grandma. This is the person that I've been working with for and developing this product for. So her interests are walking, watching TV in her free time, and keeping herself busy with household chores. And out of all those chores, her most favorite thing to do is cooking because she loves the entire process. However, she does have a problem and that is her chronic knee pain. It flares up especially in the staircase and when getting on and off the couch. And so I developed user needs based on that, what she told me, and she needs to be able to walk up and down the stairs while producing less stress on her knee, efficiently and safely walk up the stairs, easily get on and off the couch, and move around the house in areas outside the house both efficiently and quickly. And so, what I wanted to do was develop a product, in this case a walker, that is able to sufficiently support the user and release stress off their knees when moving around on flat surfaces as well as up and down the staircase. So the risks involved with developing this product may be that the product is not com comfortable for her, it doesn't support her knee properly, the measurements become a little bit off, the quality of the product may be a little bit low, and the shipping time, which actually did become a huge issue for me. However, with proper planning, most of this could be mitigated. And so this is a sketch that I had for my prototype idea, and that's with the two bike brakes that you would have here. You'd have wires attached to those bike brakes, and then this would further be attached to a spring mechanism that would go inside a hole, that once you pull on it, it would release, you'd be able to adjust the legs, and then you'd be able to release the bike brake, and then it would push the mechanism back in and lock it into place. So this is the prototype itself that I developed. So you have the PVC pipes at the bottom, and then you have the bike brakes attached here with wires. And so this is kind of how the mechanism just works in general. Once you pull on the spring mechanism, it goes up and down, and then it locks back into place. So this is just a closer look at the legs and then the bike brakes. This is a bill of materials that I use. I use two different types of PVCs, the spring mechanism itself, the walker, the bike brakes, and then the zip ties to attach the PVC to the metal part of the walker. And so as for testing, we wanted to check, make sure that the measurements worked, which it did. We wanted to make sure that it supported the weight of uh, my grandma, which it did. And we wanted to check the functionality of the legs, which is where some issues popped up. It did keep the walker level as it went up the stairs. However, the adjustable legs only somewhat worked because the, one, the first one to two times it would work, but then slack would get into the string and then it wouldn't work anymore. And then the inner leg also kept spinning as you adjusted it, so it was hard to lock into place sometimes. So in future iterations, I would like to kind of focus on those two and improve upon that. And I lastly would like to thank you for listening to my presentation. Hello, I'm Rishi Sinha, and today I'll be talking to you about detecting emotion from speech using machine learning to aid children with ASD. I participated in BWSI's Design for Assistive Technology course, and this is my BWSI final event presentation. So who am I? Like I said, I am Rishi Sinha. I am currently a rising sophomore. I was born in Boston and I currently live in San Jose, California. In my free time, I love playing guitar and saxophone. So my co-designer, if you don't know what a co-designer is, a co-designer is someone we didn't necessarily build a assistive technology for, but we built it with them. They co-designed with us, hence the name, they designed it with us. So my co-designer was my grandma. She currently lives in India, and every once in a while, she'll come and visit us in America. Before she retired, she's an elementary school English teacher, 
and now she shoots autistic children at her local orphanage. And in her free time, she loves crocheting, playing poker, and playing golf, all with her husband. So, after interviewing my co-designer, one of the biggest problems her students faced were detecting different emotions through speech. So, I came up with some user needs, and I came up with two. So, the first one was that uh, she wanted me to create something that would make it easier for her students to understand the different emotions. And second was that she wanted me to make something that would make it easier for students to detect different emotions. So my product objective, basically, what did I build? So because I had a background in CS, I decided to build software that would take a user input through a microphone, replay it, and then predict the emotion that was just said in whatever it recorded. So, and my idea is that this would be used as a learning aid for students. So they could say a sentence, it would record it, allow them to replay it, and then it would predict the emotion. So they'll now relate, okay, this is what I just said, and this is that emotion. So now they'll relate, this is how you convey yourself in that emotion. So this is my latest prototype. Here's a short video of it. Dogs are sitting by the door. Dogs are sitting by the door. Dogs are sitting by the door. All right, and as you see, it was able to guess it there as well. So some of the improvements are stuff I want to do in the future. Um, I want to find more data. So my data set was pretty small. So I only used a subset of the four out of the eight emotions. I used calm, happy, fearful, and surprised. If I find more data, I can, my accuracy would be higher. And also I want to put this into an echo dot. So um, in India, they all have echo dots. So they can like uh, talk, they could talk, say, hey, Alexa, let's practice emotions. And they could talk into their Alexa and then it will predict that emotion and they can use that as a learning aid because they're not going to be sitting at and looking at a computer the entire day. So thank you. That was my BWSI final event presentation. Again, I'm Rishi from the Design for Assistive Technology course and thank you for listening. All right. Um, then we have a few questions regarding the emotions. Um, kind of like how do you go about adding more emotions later on and do you think you will be able to add something like sarcasm or would the computer not be able to translate that? So our first about the emotions. So like I said in the video, I only, so in my data set, there's eight different emotions. I only used four of them because like the data set was pretty small. Um, and if I used all eight of them, like my model would be overwhelmed and my accuracy would be really low. So I, like I said, I use like calm, happy, fearful, and surprised in that. So if I were to find more data, I could then use all eight emotions and then my accuracy would be higher. And then sarcasm is something I could look into, but like it actually could be pretty similar because like you can tell someone's sarcastic by their pitch changing in their voice and like the features I extracted for this model, like all depended on the pitch. So yeah, sarcasm is something that you can like, do that's similar to this. Hi there, and welcome to my presentation on my project, the jar opener. I, I hope you enjoy this, inter this overview of what this project is about. So, the user need that this product is attempting to fill are the fact that um, my co-designer has weak hand strength, like very weak due to her arthritis. Her left hand is a little bit stronger than her right, but her right hand basically can exert no force at all. Also, there are many different kinds of jars. So if she wanted to open a certain jar without using her hands, one tool would work, but maybe that tool wouldn't work for all jars, especially if the jars are different sizes. The product addresses these needs by coming in a set to fit various jars of different sizes. It also requires minimal hand strength to use and can be adapted for multiple kinds of jars. Here is a video of my code designer testing the product after a prototype was built.
If I were to make improvements to this project in the future, I would probably attach teeth to the inside of, of the device, um, plastic teeth to grip the tougher seal jars and maybe make them retractable because otherwise they might not work on some jars. And I would like to change the size either by having it be squeezable and flexible or malleable or just have them come in different sets. Thank you for watching my presentation. I hope that you learned some, and I'm very happy to have done this program. Hi, so we had a question for you, Sam. Um, people were wondering where they would store your grip product, and um, how would you modify it for people with less grip strength? Um, you can just keep it wherever you want, I guess. And, I mean, the whole point is that no one basically has is, is that it's not supposed to require any strength at all hi there my name is vaishnav the agarajan and this is my final presentation for the walker i designed and so basically my co-designer is my dad his name is the agarajan um, but the product i'm designing the walker uh, is for my for my grandpa or his dad um, because two years ago, my grandpa had a stroke after he fell down. Uh, and since then, he hasn't been able to walk properly or communicate properly. Uh, so that's why I'm working with my dad. And um, my grandpa is also in India, so I can't really work with him that much. Um, so I'm working with my dad to design a product. Uh, and I'm also, uh, one of the big reasons that uh, he wants uh, a, like a he wants some sort of assistive technology to help him uh, is that he always has to have someone help him walk everywhere or else he might lose his balance and fall uh, and then hit his head. And uh, basically this actually happened a while ago, about six months after the original stroke, uh, the, the doctors were making really good progress on his recovery. Uh, and then he actually, one time he was walking without somebody next to him and he fell down, hit his head and all their progress got reset. And since then it's been, uh, the progress has been a lot slower. And so basically I wanted to make something that would help him be more independent. And so my first design and first idea uh, was actually, uh, my first uh, lo-fi prototype was in a helmet. Uh, and it was actually a CAD design of this helmet that had memory foam on the inside. Uh, as you can see, um, as you can see right here, this is all memory foam and this would have helped cushion his head in the event of a fall. Um, however, that wouldn't have been, uh, the product wouldn't have been feasible in the time frame of this course. So I had to change it and I designed a, I decided to go with the walker that has adjustable handles. Um, so this is the walker design I made, as you can see right here. Uh, this would have been the walker, this black stuff is PVC and uh, these handle parts would have been made out of uh, 8020 aluminum. However, uh, the materials would not have been able to come in time, so I had to change it again uh, just recently. And this would have been this was my final prototype, and this is the one I actually created. Um, and this is a walker that has padding on the grip area. So as you can see here, this is my dad using it. Uh, this purple uh, area, right, this purple part right here, uh, is the is foam. Uh, it's actually pool noodle foam. And as you can see here, my dad's holding it with one finger, and so you can see it's very lightweight. Uh, and right here, this is him doing a handstand. It's kind of hard to see, uh, but this is him doing a handstand on it, and it's uh, actually able to support his weight. And the foam is also not being compressed too much, also. So the results were that it worked very well. It was able to, it's able to be used for a long time and putting weight on the handles uh, was comfortable. And this is perfect for my grandpa because he actually uses public transportation a lot in India or he used to, and he also used to walk everywhere uh, like around his neighborhood. So this is very useful and uh, this will help him recover a lot. So for further changes and improvements, uh, I, I'm probably gonna go forward with the original walker design. I also wanna add an adjustable handle and use the same so, uh, foam for comfort. And I'm also gonna add some fabric for tying down. Uh, I'm also gonna tie down some fabric to make it a bit more breathable. Uh, but yeah, thanks for listening. Okay, and we have a question. Um, people were wondering how would the walker work on different surfaces or stairs or anything like that? Uh, yeah, so that's what my original walker design was for. It was going to have adjustable handles so you could use it on an incline or a decline or going up the stairs or down the stairs. Um, it's just that like the materials would not have been able to come here uh, in time. So I just decided to go with a more comfortable grip. Uh, but like after the course ends, when I have as much time as I want, I'm planning on uh, adding an adjustable handle with PVC and aluminum. All right, thank you, Vaish, and thank you, everyone else. We have seen 19 amazing presentations. So to you, the audience, thank you so much for attending our final webinar. 
Uh, as you can see, our students have created a massive volume of work and they've done a huge amount of engineering design work in service of other people. Uh, so much so that we've had to sort of compress and stress everything just so we can fit everything in the time. Uh, I think they have a lot to be proud of and I look forward to seeing the things that they're gonna make in the future. Thank you once again for attending our AT webinar.